Thank you so much for joining me today on Just Praise Him Radio. I'm your host, Linda Lomax, and my job is to inspire you to a closer walk with Christ. Now here's the show. Hello, believers. Welcome to the Just Praise Him radio show. I'm your host, Glenda Lomax, and today we're going to be talking about finding God's purpose for your life. I want to pray first. Lord, I lift up every person listening to this podcast to you right now. I pray, Lord, you would bless them and that you would open their ears to hear and their heart to receive what you want them to get from this show. There is no greater joy, Lord, than walking in your will for our lives. And I pray every listener will know that joy. Thank you, Lord. We magnify your name, Jesus, and we give you all the praise and all the glory for the revelation that we receive today. Amen. A friend emailed me this week and said they had listened to the Pink Turtle podcast twice and wanted to know why they did not have the peace that the man that worked in the Pink Turtle that I talked about had. And I can testify that the key to walking in that kind of peace is finding God's purpose for your life and living in it. And so that's what brought about this show. You know, when I was younger, I kind of just wandered through life, you know. You know how you do when you're real young, you don't really know what you want to do or be or anything like that. And and uh, you're trying to figure out who you are, <laughs> kind of. And I remember when I was 12 that I decided I wanted to be an author. I wanted to write books. I always loved books. And then when I was around 18 or early 20s, I used to read books about women who became authors and then became motivational speakers. They went around teaching on sales or whatever their speciality was. I remember one book I read was Don't Tell Me It's Impossible Until After I've Already Done It by a woman named Pam Lantos, and I believe she lived in the Dallas area. Anyway, when this was all going on, somewhere after I got saved, I heard of a spiritual gifts test, so I searched online and found one. And in a spiritual gift test, you answer a bunch of questions, and the results tell you what gifts God has placed in you. And the results are ranked from the most prominent to the least prominent as far as the gifts in you based on your answers to all the questions. And they have quite a few questions. If I remember right, it was over 100 So I took a free online test. The test I used then now asks for a donation, but anybody that wants to take the same one, the URL is www.codachrome, with a K, dot org forward slash spirit gift. I only remember it because I remembered the word Kodachrome being in it because I thought that was unusual. I only paid attention to the top three gifts. I think that's what the test says to do. And mine were writing, teaching, and I think mercy. And the results of the spiritual gift test also tell you, uh, it has little write-ups in there that tell you what each gift is used for in kingdom work. And from that, you can kind of see what God intended you to be. So, interestingly enough, I discovered that my gifts were linked to desires I had had since I was a child. Remember that scripture, Psalm 37, 4, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. The Lord places those desires into our hearts to do the things he has called us to do. That's where those desires come from. So me wanting to write books, he placed that into my heart when I was 12 years old, and I carried that with me, and I always wanted to be an author. And he made me an author. Many people say, I'm afraid to know God's will for my life. He might want me to go to Africa and live in the desert and eat insects and be a missionary. And God's will is not anything to fear. It will be something you want to pursue. His will for your life is the key to the deepest peace and the greatest level of blessing you will ever know. It is the key to the absolute fulfillment on the inside of you. Nothing that the world can offer you will ever fulfill you like walking in his purpose can. God's purpose will motivate you. I know someone who recently found his purpose for for his life and he expressed that he was afraid he might work himself to death because he has such a passion for doing it. And I love the work I do too. 
I wrote the sermon at two o'clock in the morning because of that. I woke up uncomfortable and it was one of those nights I was just suddenly wide awake. Y'all ever do that? You wake up and all of a sudden you're awake like it's morning and it's not. So I got up and I thought, well, I'll answer emails. Made a cup of coffee. And I had prayed before I went to sleep for a podcast that was something y'all really needed that would really help you. And then when I read my friend's email, I realized that I'd never told the story how I went about finding God's purpose for my life, and I knew that was it. So, um, and some people say, well, isn't it too late to find my purpose, you know, being the end of the end times and everything? No, it is not. Whatever his purpose is for you, there are souls involved. And, you know, I read somewhere, somebody said, you know, the Lord would build a $10 million church save one soul and then tear the whole thing down just to get that one soul. And he really cares about souls more than anything else. So whatever his purpose is for you, there are souls involved. And whatever his purpose is for you, you will have peace and great happiness doing it. Even if it's just for one month, it's worth it. When you show up in heaven, you want to know you have your homework with you, right? Your homework's done. I don't know about y'all. When I went to school, I always did my homework. I don't know if y'all did or not. So when I found out that my gifts were teaching and writing and mercy, the mercy gift just gives you great compassion. It, it, the mercy gift, if you don't know, if, so, if you're around somebody else and they're in pain, you literally feel their pain. And animals, you feel their pain. I mean, the mercy gift just makes you feel everything around you. It's a very painful gift to carry. Can I just say that? So when I found out those were my gifts, I started studying the word more, and I started practicing writing sermons and preaching them just to myself, not to anybody else. Because I, <laughs> I didn't really know anything to preach on back then. I, this was like 1997 or something. I mean, I'd been saved for like 20 minutes. You know, I'd just gotten into the walk. I didn't know anything. And as I applied diligence to that, and I kept, you know, trying to write sermons. And I did start a newsletter eventually, and I started writing articles for that. And I practiced that way and researching. And I kept studying the Word and writing stuff and preaching my little, you know, mini sermons and then listening to them to see how they sounded and listening to other sermons and kind of uh, looking at the way they're put together. And then the Lord began to take me into the wilderness and he began to refine me and he began to teach me about himself and he began to give me revelation about the wilderness. And of course I journaled then. I don't have time now, but I journaled then and I wrote everything in journals. I have like two boxes of journals that are just chock full. So I wrote everything down. And after I came out of the most terrifying wilderness of 2009, 2010, when I thought I was going to be homeless, he sent me word through two different friends that I was supposed to be writing a book. And I went to him and I said, what book? You know, what book are we supposed to be writing here? And he said, I want you to write about the wilderness and tell people how I took care of you there. And I said, okay, I know how to do that. So I drug out all the journals, which he had told me to write in 1997, because he said, you're going to need those to tell the story. And I, I didn't even ask him what story. But um, so I started writing The Wilderness Companion. And I've been writing ever since. I don't, I think I've written like, what, nine books in 10 years, something like that, or nine years. Because I really kind of stopped after The Grief Companion. Okay. So that's how I found out my purpose and started walking in my purpose. I started, I did what I knew to do, and then the Lord picked up, and he brought me the rest of I asked him back in 97. I asked him, I said, Lord, do you want me to enroll in Bible college? Do you want me to go to seminary? No. I asked him again. Another, you know, I kept asking him, like, for, for about four or five years, I asked him at least once a year. I think I asked him more than that because I wanted to be sure that he didn't want me to go you know, get some kind of education to do what he called me to do. Now I understand why he didn't want me to do that. Because he did not ever intend for me to write, you know, Christian books in perfect grammar and all that. Your, your calling and your personality will go together. And when he adds his anointing on top of that, there will be a specific group of people who will respond to you, who will get what you're saying. 
I am not everybody's cup of tea and you're not everybody's cup of tea either. We each reach a specific group of people and that's all we need to do. That's who he's called us to and that's what we're supposed to be doing, okay? So you just got to find out what you're supposed to do and then he knows who the people are. You just find out what you're supposed to do and start doing it. He'll do the rest. Okay, so some people say, well, what if I don't have what I need to complete God's purpose for my life? Okay, first of all, if he called you to preach, he didn't tell you to build a church. He just said preach. If you're called to preach, then you need to work on learning how to preach. And if you're called to preach, you need a knowledge of the word. So start there. Okay, start at the beginning. Don't try to run out in front of God because you'll mess everything up if you do that. You don't want to do that. And you never have to be concerned with not having what you need to complete his purpose for your life because where God guides, he always provides, always. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack. Hello. The scripture says I shall not want. If you look that word want up in the Strong's, it means lack. I shall not lack. Okay. He's your shepherd. He's going to guide you where you need to go. He's going to make sure you have what you need. And remember, when you think you're waiting on him, you will often find that he has been waiting on you. Y'all, I didn't have anything to bring to the table for my purpose except my life experiences and my willingness to do whatever he wanted me to do. Guess what God needed? You got it. My life experiences and my willingness to do what he called me to do. He just needed me to be on board with what he wanted to do th through me and to submit to wherever he wanted to take me to do his purpose. So I needed to have some idea of what they were so I could submit to them. Okay, let's look at what the Bible says. I want to talk to y'all about God's will. Now, his will and his purposes, I think, are different. But they're both important. I'm going to explain that. Romans 12, 2. Be not conformed, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I believe the Lord is always trying to show us his will for our lives. Why wouldn't he be? He's the one who chose it for us. So be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What he's saying is renew your mind from the world by his word, okay? It's very important. In order for us to see what he wants for our life, we need to think like he thinks. You can't think like the world and figure out what God wants you to do. To do that, we need our minds renewed in his word. That is how you get the mind of Christ, by hearing his word, reading his word, meditating on his word. But the first step is simple. Be submitted to him. To be submitted means to understand and accept that he is God and he is in charge and you are to follow where he leads, wherever that is. Inevitably, every single time I've ever talked about finding God's purpose for your life, multiple people pipe up. I usually get a slew of emails that say, well, I'm called to be a manager. I'm called to lead a large congregation. I'm called to manage a big, you know, Fortune 500 company. And I always laugh when I hear these because I know that person has no inkling at all of their calling. That is someone who has pride and is scared to death of submission because they don't know who they are in Christ. When you know who you are in Christ, you're not afraid to submit. They are afraid of humility when the truth is humility is the most beautiful of all virtues. Everyone loves a person who is humble. We are drawn to humility like moths to a flame. The least physically attractive person in all the world is beautiful if they are clothed in humility. Another reason I laugh when people say that they are called to manage this or that is because I know the Lord trains his servants in humility extensively before they are fit to manage. And you would never hear that come out of the mouth of someone trained in humility. You must understand authority from the inside out on both sides of the fence before you are qualified to manage people and resources in a godly manner. So if you want to sign up for management, you just go ahead and let him know you want to do that. Just know what the training program is going in. Okay, let's review some scriptures about God's will for us. Psalm 143.10 says, Teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God. 
Thy spirit is good. Lead me into the land of uprightness. So Psalm 143.10 tells us that we can ask God to teach us to do his will. Matthew 21.32 says, For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and you believed him not, but the, the publicans and harlots believed him. And you, when you had seen it, repented not afterward that you might believe him. So Matthew 21.32 tells us that God's will is that we believe and repent. We know from John 3.16 that it is always his will that a person be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That tells us that he wants everybody to have everlasting life in heaven with him. He doesn't want anybody to perish. Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Hebrews 13, 17 tells us that we are to submit to the authorities over us. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 and 4 says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. So 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 and 4 tells us, it is God's will that we are sanctified. To be sanctified means you get the sin out of your life, even if you have to ask him for help on some of them. So you are walking in holiness and you are set apart for God's use. In that way, we honor him in our self-discipline in abstaining from sin. 1 Peter 2.15 says, For so is the will of God, that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. So 1 Peter 2.15 tells us it is God's will that we go about doing good. And that means to be kind, to be loving, to forgive, to give to good works, to give to the church, that sort of thing. Take care of widows and the fatherless. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So 1 Thessalonians 5.18 tells us God's will is that we give thanks for every single thing. Now y'all notice here it does not differentiate between the bad and the good. It's important when reading this to remember that nothing happens that God does not allow. So if he allowed something bad and we know his intention towards us are always good, because we, he, we know how much he loves us, then we can be thankful for the bad things that happen too and believe him that something good will come out of them. So it is always God's will that we give thanks in everything, good or bad. So there's a whole list from the word of God that we know does not include every single thing that's his will, but that we can start with as far as doing God's will for our lives while we seek his purpose for our life. Now, here's something important to understand. God's will is what he wants us to do. His purpose is what he has called us to do, what we were created for, okay? God the Father wanted Jesus to be good and without sin. That was his will, okay? Jesus' purpose was to die for the sins of the world and be the Lamb of God. Does that make sense? God's will for Jesus was to be good, you know, be a good man, be good, be without sin, go about doing good, that sort of thing. That was his will for Jesus. But the purpose that God created Jesus for was to die for the sins of the world, to die for all of us so we could come to heaven, okay? However, he would not have been the perfect lamb of God and been able to die for the sins of the world had he not also done God's will and gone about doing good and lived a life without sin. Does that make sense? And if you think that the things I just listed above that are God's will are unimportant, let me explain something to you. God is far more concerned about your character than he is about your calling. Because if you can't get your character right, your calling is useless. All right? If your character is not in line with God's word, your calling is useless. Let's just say you're called to be an evangelist, okay? And let's say that you're a woman and you're shacking up with your boyfriend, okay? 
and God wants you to evangelize your apartment complex. Guess how many people that know you're shacked up with your boyfriend are going to listen to your witness about God? Zilch. Why? You have no credibility as a Christian witness if you are not living like a Christian. You don't even believe what you're saying. If I believe my house is on fire, I'm going to run out the house, okay? If you believe that God is God and that sin is wrong, you're not going to be sinning, all right? So if you're sinning, obviously you don't believe what's coming out your mouth. I'm just saying. I'm telling you all the truth. I'm trying to help you. God is far more concerned about your character than he is about your calling. And he will not set you into your calling if your life is full of sin. Can I just tell you that? He might even prevent you from it until you get your act together. Remember, he wants us to be sanctified. I don't think that's too much to ask from somebody who died for you. You may see it some other way. Okay, so if you don't know what your purpose is, work on what God's will is for you using this list. Here's a recap. Ask the Lord to help you to do his will. Believe and repent. Believe in Jesus and repent of your sins. That means get saved if you're not. Submit to the authorities over you. That's your pastor, your boss, whoever. Go about doing good each day and in everything give thanks. Okay, so you would be doing that while you're working on your purpose. We can also find a spiritual gifts test online and take that. Answer it honestly. Do not give the expected answer. Don't try to give the answer you think they expect. Give the answer from your heart or your results won't be right on the test. Okay? Give the answer from your heart. Then look at your top three gifts according to the test and, and read up on what those gifts are used for in kingdom work. The gifts test will tell you that. Those are the things the Lord has created you to do. So start pursuing those. And that is what's going to bring you peace and fulfillment. Okay? You can study up or research how to learn how to do whatever he's called you to do. If you're called to be an evangelist, there's not much to learn because every time you open your mouth, that's what's going to come out. Okay. I hope that this has been a blessing to you. Again, for anyone who wants to take the same spiritual gifts test I took, I don't know if it's better than the others. I just know it worked for me. They do ask for a donation now, but the test can be found at www.codachrome, that's with a K, dot org forward slash spirit gift. Lord, I lift up every believer listening to this podcast and I ask you, Lord, that you would lead them into what you have called them to do and be. Lead them in joy, Lord. Help them to find the peace and fulfillment only walking in your purpose for our life can bring. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks for listening. Jesus bless you. Y'all have a great week. Thank you so much for tuning in today to Just Praise Him Radio. You can contact me by mail at my new address, JPH Inc., Glenda Lomax, P.O. Box 60, Glencoe, Arkansas, 72539 or by email at jphtoday at gmail.com JPH is not affiliated with any nonprofit organization church or denomination Have you ever gone through a time in your life where suddenly it just felt like your whole life was falling apart? I call these experiences the wilderness experiences. Wilderness experiences are a time of great uncertainty and change. Uh, There are times when our faith is tried and refined. After many experiences, the Lord spoke to me to write The Wilderness Companion, which is a virtual roadmap through the desert times of your life. Find out why you've been led to the wilderness. Find out what the biggest hindrance is to receiving provision in the wilderness. Find out what the seven temptations of the wilderness are. Drastically cut the time you spend in the wilderness by learning how to partner with the Lord instead of working against Him. Every Christian needs to read The Wilderness Companion. 
It's by Glenda Lomax and it's available on Amazon.com or WingsOfProphecy.com. Amazon.com, The Wilderness Companion by Glenda Lomax. Do you know someone suffering from domestic violence or another form of abuse like verbal abuse? Did you know abuse has deep spiritual roots that cause abuse to be attracted to a person throughout their lifetime? Now, the Escaping Abuse Study Guide helps you discover and remove those spiritual roots so you won't be an abuse magnet. Get the Escaping Abuse Study Guide or get one for a friend. Available now on Amazon.com. Escaping Abuse Study Guide by Glenda Lomax. Available now on Amazon.com. Are there areas of your life you just can't seem to overcome in, no matter what you try? Are you plagued by depression, poverty, anger, lust, or failure? Do you recognize your predisposition to commit the same sins committed by your forefathers? Do you want a better life? Many people live their whole lives under generational and other types of curses without understanding they can be free. Learn what the scriptures say about curses and why they are still relevant today. Learn how to defeat every one of them through the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. Hosea 4, 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. You can break the curses off your life and start experiencing breakthroughs like never before. Read about different types of curses and how to break them, including anger, a curse that causes angry outbursts and constant anger. Barrenness, a curse that causes miscarriages and prevents pregnancies. Fear, a curse that brings a plague of fear and anxiety. Illegitimacy, a curse that causes lust, rebellion, and sexual dysfunction. Get the book, Loosed from Chains of Darkness, Destroying Curses Through the Power of the Cross. Available now on Amazon.com. Available in print version, Kindle version, and new audiobook. Chapter 15, Curse of Illegitimacy, also known as the Bastard Curse. What is the illegitimacy curse, also known as the Bastard Curse? What does it cause, and how can you tell if you're living under it? Deuteronomy 23.2 A bastard shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to his tenth generation shall he not enter into the congregation of the Lord. A bastard is commonly defined as a child conceived out of wedlock. Notice that definition is not defined by when the child is born, but when it was conceived. A recent study by the CDC shows 40.6% of U.S. births were to unmarried women in 2013, which means this curse is rampant in our population right now. Deuteronomy 23.2 says a bastard shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even to his tenth generation. Although scripture does not say definitively how long a generation is, if it is even 40 years, that means this curse continues for a minimum of 400 years on these children and their generations. What happens if someone does not enter the congregation of the Lord? They lose all the benefits of the congregation, also called the assembly in the Strongs. They lose the fellowship, encouragement, and other benefits of being part of the congregation or assembly of the Lord. This curse is lust and rebellion based. Lust because it is lust that causes us to get into fornication instead of waiting on marriage and God's full blessing on our union. And rebellion because fornication is rebellion against God's rules about sex and his way of doing things. Because of the link to lust and rebellion, lust and rebellion will always be seen in the lives of these illegitimate children, usually for their entire lives. 